This week we start a new book of the Torah, book of Sefer Shmos. And uh, the beginning of Sefer Shmos is very difficult, it's very tragic. And God in his mercy only has about a chapter or two on that, which uh, for a long period of time, uh, over a hundred year, nearly a hundred years, were extremely, extremely terrible, horrific living conditions for the Jewish people, suffering of the worst imaginable ways. And this is the first of the Jewish exiles. So we want to give a kind of an overview of understanding this whole idea, and it's going to touch on a very uh, sensitive topic. And for those who were with me Thursday morning, um, when we talked about the Holocaust and we ended up with some questions, it's going to continue on that theme a little bit to maybe fill in a few more gaps for that. So let us begin with the source of the Jews going down to Egypt. And that goes back to the Parsha's Lech Lecha at the Bris Ben Abbasarim, the covenant between the parts between Avram and Hashem. And when Hashem told Avram that, that his descendants would inherit the land of Israel, so Avram says the infamous words, he says, Bama Eida. He says in the first source, My Lord Hashem Elohim, whereby shall I know that I'm going to inherit it? How do I know that, that, the, that my children will have the land of Israel? And Hashem says, Yadoh you shall surely know that your offspring shall be aliens in a land not their own. And then the Torah goes into great detail and they will serve them and they will oppress them for 400 years. There will be all kinds of suffering. And this is the prophecy that tells us how the Jews will be in exile for 400 years. This is the first prophecy of any exile for the Jews and the suffering that they would have. So if you read the text alone in, in Parshas Lech Lecha, it would simply be understood as in order for the Jewish people to be on a level to live in Eretz Yisrael, somehow, through the suffering in the exile, the Jews will be refined so that they'll be worthy to live in Eretz Yisrael. That's from the text alone, that's about all you can take out of the text. You can't really take out much more. There's not a lot of explanation. And that will explain why the Jews suffered in Egypt. The Maharal, in his Sefer Gvura Hashem in the ninth chapter, he discusses this topic at great length, and it's really a worthwhile class in and of itself. One day we'll do that. But one of the questions he asks is, okay, so you want to tell me that the Jews needed a certain degree of suffering for a certain degree of refinement to be able to live in Eretz Yisrael. So that can explain the last generations of Jews who were in Egypt who were part of the Exodus experience and went into the land of Israel. This does not explain 210 years of the Jews being in Egypt where there were people who were born in the exile, died in the exile, and never got out of the exile. So how, do you, how, do, how does that happen? How does that, like what, what happened with them? Right? How did, how did the suffering of the previous generations prepare the Jews to live in Eretz Yisrael? So therefore, and there's a host of other questions he has, and therefore the morale says, and other people say the same thing, he says that really the reason why the Jews had to go through the suffering of Egypt was for various sins that Avram Avinu did. Various sins. And we'll just pick on the one that's relating to what we're talking about. When he said, when he said, I, how will I know? And I don't want to get into the details of the sin, but he said there, there was created within, or existed within Avram Avinu, a certain pagam, a certain blemish, a distortion, and what's worse is that since Avram is the root of the Jewish people, so that's like no different than if you're building a hundred story building, that if the very foundation is a little bit off, there's no way that you can build and build and build upon something with a very weak foundation, so, uh, and it has to be corrected to the extreme, so the same thing with the Jewish people, since Avram was the foundation, there was a crack in the foundation would require generations of suffering to repair this. And, the, the, the mean, not, and even those that didn't get there to Israel, it would require generations to repair it. And that's why it had all that suffering. The, in the Kisve Harizal, which goes into the deeper ideas, 
deeper reasons for everything and for the Golis, he takes it a step earlier. He says, really there was a blemish in first man after his sin. And there were many terrible generations. The generation of Enosh that worshipped idols. The generation of the flood. The generation of the Tower of Babel. The generation of Sodom. And all those people died with totally no tikkun to their lives. So the Arizal suggests, not suggests, says, that all the Jews who suffered in the land of Mitzrayim, they were all Gilgulim, they were all reincarnated souls of all those neshamas that died without any tikkun, and now they got corrected by being in Egypt. You know, for example, the boys being thrown into the water, that was a tikkun for the generation of the flood. The building of the, uh, of the storehouses in Pisum and Ramses, and the Jews built it, and it was built on land that could not support it, and it would just sink back into the ground, and they have to rebuild it and rebuild and rebuild it. It's a tikkun for the Dora Flaga who built the Tower of Babel. I don't want to get into the details again. But the Arizal says that was the purpose of it. So both the Maral and the Arizal, they say that the purpose of the Gaul is what, what, was what we would call an overall term, Yisurim Shalavo, sufferings of love. These sufferings were meant to bring certain corrections and although the Jews in Egypt were not specifically at fault but there were other faults that had to be addressed and the Jews would be the vehicle to address it and that is why there was the sufferings. That's deeper understandings as to what was going on. So we want to address two questions today. Number one is why doesn't the Torah at least hint to any one of these two reasons. If you go through the whole book of Shmos, you don't get one iota of an idea of why the Jewish people suffered in Mitzrayim. It's, it's very hard. And more than that, when we read the Haggadah on Pesach, which is an elaboration of the Pesach story, it doesn't explain it much more. It doesn't give it either. You know, why is there no question of the children why did the Jews have to suffer in Egypt? Should be one of the questions. And then we give them the answer, the reason. We give them the answer, the morale. You know, and that, why isn't that in the Haggadah? As opposed to the four famous exiles that the Jews went through after the destruction of the first temple, the exile of Babylonia and, and Persia and Greece and Rome, there the prophets and the Talmud, they go into great detail for the reasons for the exiles. So, so why, why not anything mentioned about Egypt? Really not, not very much mentioned. And more than that, what were Jews thinking about for hundreds of years till the Arizal came along in the 1500s, and the morale in the 1600s, to give us any reasons for this? Okay. So what, why is the Torah avoiding this? And we're going to get to a much broader uh, the answer is that this question is not as significant as the point we're trying to bring out from all this. So to appreciate all this, let's bring you uh, two very famous uh, chazal that you are all aware of on one form or another. And I've given to you them in source two and source three. I'm just giving you little abridged versions of them. The first is a famous Gemara Menachas. Gemara Menachas says, when Moshe came up to the heavens to receive the Torah, he found Hashem was sitting by the Sefer Torah and Hashem was putting little crowns on all the letters of the Sefer Torah. If you look at, if you look at the Sefer Torah, there's little crowns in the shape of a Zion. That's, some have three heads, two, one. If you look, it's not just the letters, there's crowns there. So Moshe Rabbeinu said, Hashem, who's holding you back from giving the Torah as it is? What's wrong? Give the Torah without crowns. What do you have to put crowns on the Torah for? I don't have the whole thing. I just give you the main things in the source sheet. So, it's, uh, so Hashem says there's going to be a man who is destined to exist at the end of many generations and Akiva ben Yosef is his name and he will expound on each and every point each and every little dot of those crowns he's going to expound hundreds and hundreds of laws from this so we need it for him and as Moshe looked at these crowns he had no idea what these crowns were talking about Hashem says there's going to be someone who is so Moshe said to Hashem so show him to me. I'd like to take a look at this guy. So give me a little bit of a future picture of what's going to go. So Hashem says, okay. 
So Hashem says, turn around. And, uh, oh, I'm sorry. So he, he then finds himself in the classroom of Rabbi Akiva. Okay? He's in the back. He's at the end of eight rows of students. And he's listening to the class, what's going on with the Rebbe Kiva students, and Moshe Rabbeinu did not understand one word that was going on in the class. Right? Didn't understand one word that was going on in the class. So he became disheartened, and his strength ebbed. He says, what's going on? I'm almost just garnished. I'm the one giving the Torah. I don't even, I can't even, I don't even understand what's going on in this class. But when one, they reached a certain matter in the class, and they said, we need a source, Rebbe Akiva. So he said to this, so they said, Rebbe, how do you know this law, Rebbe? He said, this is halacha la Moshe Misina. This was a law that was transmitted orally to Moshe. Oh, so Moshe felt a little bit relieved. So now he comes back before Hashem. He said, I saw, I saw the little visit. He said, Master of the Universe, you have someone like this and you give the Torah through me? Why am I the one giving the Torah? Rebbe Kiva is ten times smarter than me. Why are you doing this? So Hashem says, Shtok, be quiet. Kach Allah b'machshav l'fanai. This is what I have thought before. It, it, literal translation, this thus has it arisen in the thoughts before me. That's the answer. So then Moshe asked another question. He says, okay, you showed me his Torah. You showed me his Torah. Now show me his reward. What's your going to get for teaching Torah like this? Hashem says, okay, turn around. He turns around and he saw that people were weighing the flesh of Rabbi Akiva's body in the meat market in order to sell it. After his skin was flayed off of him, they had filet of Akiva. And they sold a pound of Akiva meat. Mass universe, Torah, Zu Torah, this is the Torah, this is the reward. Hashem says, Shtok, be quiet. Kach This is what, what thoughts I had on my mind before me. That's the Gemara. So, the obvious question on both answers is what kind of answer is this? And Moshe left this world not knowing the answer. Now, I mean, and Hashem said, forget it. I'm not going to tell you the answer. And Hashem, we know, didn't hide anything from Moshe. He told him all the secrets of the universe. He wanted to know a lot of things and he told him a lot of things. So why couldn't he give him that answer? Now, obviously, if Moshe can't get this answer, then we're not going to get this answer either. Now, there's another source, very similar uh, of, in kind, which you say twice a year. Well, not everybody. Um, it's in the Yom Kippur Mosque, it's during Musaf, so only the fraction of people who hang on to the bitter end of Musaf say this. And then the other time of the year is on Tisha B'Av in the morning during Kikinos. Again, a very fraction of Jewish people say this. It's the story of the ten martyrs. The ten great tzaddikim who the, who the, uh, who the Roman king um, had them all killed. And it's, if you ever read it, it is one of the most gruesome stories of how the holiest, holiest tzaddikim were killed in the most brutal ways. And uh, you know, we don't have to go into the gruesome details, right? Uh, but finally, uh, midway through all this suffering, and this is where you have it written in Yeshua's number three. So the celestial seraphim cried out bitterly. Now it's not Moshe Rabbeinu crying, it's the Malachim. The Malachim, who are smarter than Moshe Rabbeinu. Is this the Torah and this this reward? O God who cloaks himself in light as with a garment? The enemy insults your great and awesome name and reviles and blasphemes against the words of the Torah? What kind of Chil Hashem is this? You've got the greatest Torah leaders in the world, the holiest people, and they're being brutally uh, killed in, in the most torturous way. So a voice from heaven responded, said, if I hear another sound, I will transform the universe to water. I will turn the earth to astonishing emptiness which in Hebrew sounds a little bit better. I will turn the world back, letovavo, back to tovavo, the way it was before the world was created. An astonishing, that's what tovavo means, an astonishing emptiness. He says, this is the decree from my presence, kablu, accept it, you who delight in the 2,000 year old law. 
because this was already uh, already coming to the end of the two thousand, the second two thousand years of history, from Avram Avinu until the year four thousand approximately. So that's the two thousand years of Torah. So those of you who delight in the two thousand year old law, those of you who study Torah, accept it. Okay. So again, another difficult to understand situation. And here the answer seems to be a, a bit different. Both times, uh, you know, first time to Moshe said, be quiet. Here it says, Sim says, if I hear another sound. In the Rabbi Akiva story, it says, this is what came to my thought. Here he says, if you're going to ask any more questions, I will turn the whole world back to the way it was before creation. A little bit different nuance, what, what's being added here. Accept it, and now he's specifically saying, you who delight in the 2,000 year old law. Why do you have to add that? Just say accept it. No, you who delight in the 2,000 year old law. What, what is that coming to tell us? Okay, so these are the questions. So basically, and really it comes back, it all comes back to Yitzhak Mitzrayim, because when you talk about any kind of suffering, we all come back to, to the Egyptian exile. And again, I, I, I have to emphasize the fact that it's, it's, it's historical and it's, you know, 3,300, 3, 3,500 years old, you know, people tend to be very desensitized. You know, people, and I'm not taking away chas v'shom, people say, now the Holocaust, now that was a Holocaust. You know, if I would dare say that Egypt was a Holocaust, many people would take offense to it. And I'm not going to get into a debate with people about this. You know, the Holocaust is, it was terrible, yeah, but it was six years. The Egyptian servitude, in its worst frame, was like was was a hundred years, you know, and uh, the only thing that the Egyptians lacked was the scientific knowledge that the Germans had, but the things the Egyptians did was just terrible things, you know, taking a baby and wanting it to be killed at the birth or throwing babies in the Nile River was no different than do than Dr. Mengele's experiments. Maybe they're just were able to give maybe a little more pain. Slaughtering thousands of babies so Par could bathe in their blood doesn't seem to be a very nice thing either. You know, so, okay, so in the, in the Hagas they shoot a baby, they do this. So Par killed them. I mean, it was, it's, throw a baby, throw a baby into a wall, a brick wall, and put the cement on the rest of the wall that was going on in Egypt. Was the Holocaust so much worse than that? But, like, I'm not going to debate it, you know, if there's Holocaust survivors around, they're going to get all insulted that no one could have suffered more than them. I'm not going to judge them. But I'm just saying, like, we just kind of say, oh, Egypt was Egypt. It's, it's historical. It's just facts. It's not, because you have pictures. You see bones of Jewish skeletons. You don't think there were skeleton bones in Egypt? You don't think there were mass graves in Egypt? Right? So, you know, any, any, any discussion of Holocaust or any Jewish suffering, you really have to know it started in Egypt. So if we don't understand, if we don't get a handle on what happened in Egypt, we can't get a handle on anything. So it's a lot easier to learn about Egypt because we're a lot more dispassionate. Because it's just, it's just history. <laughs> you know, it's not my grandfather. Right? Okay, I'm not going to deny there's emotional connections, but we're trying to talk intellectually today. So that whole idea of, okay, very nice. So e e let's put it this way, even after the Arizal and even after the Maral, you know, what did it help, you know, but, but a person says, but, but how, how, could it, how could it hurt so much? Why would God make it hurt that much? That's one refrain, I would, with all the answers we'll say, but it's still not that much pain. You want him to die, kill him. But with the kind of torture that they had, uh, I, I spoke, uh, when, I, when we were in Buffalo a couple weeks ago, and I, I spoke at Shalshudis, so one of the members came over to me, right, like between Shalshudis and Marv, like there's no time. He says, so Rabbi, tell me why the Holocaust was. <laughs> so I was like, thank you, like how many hours have you got, right? So after all the answers, you know, still, it just doesn't seem right. And how do we understand this Gemara where Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't understand the answers? And what's this idea of kach ola b'machshava? So it ascended in my thoughts. What does this mean? So there's a sefer written by a rabbi who lived many hundreds of years ago that was more contemporarily published, a sefer called Or HaTorah, and Parshas Yisro, from a person by the name of Sholem Toumim, who is a nephew of the Prima Godim. And he studied under many Hasidic rebbes. And he expands on this concept of Kach Olo B'Machshava. Thus is what came upon my thoughts. And that's what I want to spend the most of the class today, and I want to develop this idea. And this is a hard concept. It's a hard concept intellectually, 
and for those who are going through sorrows in life emotionally it's hard to deal with so there are two hard concepts over here so let's let's just take this slowly we'll just do very very logical it's a very logical presentation here will not uh, you know, help you emotionally yet starting with point number one what do we know about God God is infinite okay that's step number one he is the aim self he is infinite and from this infinite being was revealed a Torah to mankind Hashem the infinite being revealed his Torah to mankind now this Torah descended into our reality at the giving of the Torah at Sinai now this great awesome light is really when you say Torah it's it's really a code word for what is God thinking isn't it is not what the Torah is it's what it comes from God's thinking it doesn't come from anywhere else so now what's the problem the problem inherent in such a Torah is it's obvious that what God is really thinking can never be perceived by finite human beings it's not possible for a finite human being to understand what an infinite being understands and the Tanya talks about this in the 8th chapter and he says so what Hashem did was he filtered his awesome light of genius in a way that would descend from one level to the next until it finally came down into our world and we know that Torah is, 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 is uh, understood on four levels of Pardes. Pardes is the orchard. Pei standing for Pshat, Resh for Remesh, Dalad for Drush, Samach for Sod. There's deeper and deeper levels that human beings are capable of understanding. So when God gave us his infinite understanding, from the place of infinite understanding, God, as it were, uh, cloaked it in utensils that are more easily accessible to us so when you read a simple pasuk you read a simple pasuk you know in, in this week's parsha, para says Hava nishach, you know, let us deal wisely with the Jews or any pasuk like that Hashem was able to bring it down to this world that even a simple child can understand it on the child's level but you have to remember that the actual light the actual real thinking of Hashem is enclosed in such a thick veil that to the simple person says, oh, I understand what God is saying. Right? So in the world of Pshat, in the world of understanding the Pshat, the simple text, you read the text, you have Rashi, Ramban, they explain to you what was going on in the story and the little child understands it. Do we going to say he understood everything that Hashem meant in this verse? Absolutely not then there are thoughts that are more thinly veiled that's the next level that's remes the hints and then there's other that are more thinly veiled than that that's the drush and even more than that's the sod the secrets of the Torah now that doesn't mean to say that it's easier to perceive but it means that those deeper levels are closer to the one who gave it to us it's closer to Hashem and when the Ramban will give you and now peace out and, and Kabbalistically we understand like this and he only gives you a couple words and you don't understand what in the world he's talking about and if we're lucky we can have great Sadiq and we'll expand for hours what he meant so it doesn't mean that it's easier to understand but it means it's coming closer to the source and the less veiled it is the harder to understand on a simple level on a simple level uh, the sun okay now that we're 93 million miles away from the sun and uh, you know and we're in a room where the sun is not directly shining on us we can benefit from the sunlight but the closer we get to the sunlight the more difficult it is to look at it the more difficult it is to look at it and uh, you know we would we have to have deeper ways of looking at it without injuring ourselves so similarly you know doesn't doesn't mean that now that I'm going to a deeper level of Torah it doesn't mean it's easier to understand it but it's closer to the source who gave it to us now all these four levels what all these four levels that a human being this is what a human being is capable of understanding they all share something in common even though the child only understands the pshat and the Kabbalist even understands the deepest soul the deepest secrets but they all have one common denominator 
it's different levels of understanding and all these levels the, 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 the Kabbalists call these are kalim, these are utensils that Hashem has created so that people who have finite minds will be able to understand and grasp a taste of the infinite thoughts of God so everything we have that's called Torah these are called kalim, these are tools these are tools to perceive a little bit of everything that is really involved in what God is thinking about in the Torah that he gave to us. So some are a little bit better tools, right? Some, you know, you want to look more at the sun, you give you whatever these ultra, whatever these sunglasses, face, special glasses you can wear, and it was, you know, if there's an eclipse, right, you can't look at the sun, you go blind, but there's certain machines you could look through, it's a different kind of tool that you can see it, but you're not really seeing. Who would see the sun the best? Anybody who's standing right next to the sun will get the best description of the sun. There's one problem, they're going to fry. Right? So, God's infinite wisdom is given over in a distilled fashion on different levels that human beings from different levels of amount of finite intelligence are able to perceive the Torah that's there. But the actual thought, the actual thought that's on Hashem's mind before it was distilled, way up where it starts, before it was distilled level after level to the point where then angels and people could begin to grasp these ideas. The original thought in the pure, pristine, infinitely godly form is completely out of man's reach. Completely out of man's reach. There are no utensils in this world that can possibly receive the actual thoughts of Hashem. It's just not possible. Let me try to make this a little more clear. Let's say whenever two people communicate, Whenever two people communicate, the way you're going to communicate depends a lot on who you're talking to. And depending on the intelligence of that person, that's how many kalim, that's how many utensils you're going to have to prepare. If you want to communicate a very lofty idea to a child, if you, would, you can't tell them that the answer the way you would say it to an adult. Right? You've got to take that original thought, you've got to distill it, you've got to filter it to the point that even the child understands it. And that's why you find in the Tanakh and you find in the Chazal that we make the use of Mishalim, of a mushal, of a parable. As I'm going to use one soon. All right, that will make it very clear, but I can't use it yet. I have to explain a little bit more. But why do they use parables so many times? Because for our little puny minds, we couldn't figure it out. But the parable is the tool that says, oh, I get it. I have some idea of what it's like. And then, for the, our mind, we have some idea of what it is, but it certainly isn't what it really is, because it's beyond any type of description. So what does a mushal do? What does a parable do? It takes, you know, something that's spiritual, and it clothes it in a physical story. That's why Rabbi Nachman always talks about stories, you know, with the captive princess, and the king, and this and that. When we say a king, it means Hashem, and the princess, it means one of the Jewish people. And we understand what a king is, and we understand what a princess is. So on our simple level, we have some appreciation for what a Kodesh Baruch Hu is. And we call, we, in fact, we say, Avinu Malkeinu, that's a marshal. Hashem's much more than a father, he's much more than a king for our puny brains. If we could understand what it means to be a, a magnanimous king and a loving father, well, I have some understanding what Hashem is. But to say that's what he is, that's totally not true. It's totally not true. We don't know what Hashem is. He, can, he, he conveys Mishalim to us to use. Right? So, uh, so whenever, whenever we communicate to people, we're doing this. Depending on the perceptions and the ability, if I would ask somebody, explain to me how this computer works, and I don't know anything about computers, you'd have to come up with some kind of an analysis and say, Rabbi, I can't explain to you exactly, you don't know what all these pieces are and this and that, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit of an analogy to help you understand what it means, because I don't know what's going on. So tell me, how does the email work? Like, like what, how come I type again, it goes over there? Right? I don't know anything. You guys like capacitors, resistors. I don't even know the names of it. these probably antiquated terms now. Capacitors, resistors was in the 60s and 70s. I don't even know the terms to use. And you said, you know, you start telling me it's a hip scalator or something. I say, what's that? I don't, I don't even know. Well, it's, it's this A, B, C, D words I can't even understand. And that makes it go. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, well, no, so then you try to say, okay, well, you know, think about an energy source. And then th you know, I start giving Mishalim. And that's certainly not what's going on, but at least my little puny brain is able to understand this. So if you, and on the other hand, if you would tell a child the actual thought that's going on, 
with no garments, number one, the child wouldn't understand what you're talking about. And, and ultimately, he might become intimidated and even frightened by something that's totally confusing. So being a good parent and being a good teacher requires you to be mitzam tseng, to constrict the profundity of, of your thoughts and veil them to the point where even a child can say, I understand what you're talking about. And a child does understand on his level. On his level, he understands this. But deeper, they just don't have the caleb. They don't have the intellectual ability to understand this. Okay. But a person is finite and Hashem is infinite. And infinite means that uh, that just as when Hashem said when he gave the Ten Commandments and he began to talk to us Anochi Hashem Elokech I am the Lord so what was when Hashem says that or puts it into the Luchos so that means Hashem's thoughts have descended into the world via different letters of the Aleph base and they form the words Anochi Hashem Elokech and just like those physical words could descend into our world after an infinite amount of filters that Hashem made but that original thought of Hashem you know so that at least part of that original thought can descend into this world but just the just like the original thought of Hashem when he said Anochi is beyond us something totally capable beyond us that reality that reality of it totally being beyond us is what we call Kach Ola B'Machshava this is what came upon my mind that's what the term means when Chazal uses the term this is coming from my infinite place of understanding and thinking and since it's coming from that place you can't ask me any questions because the finite mind cannot understand the pure pristine thinking of Hashem it's just not capable and, and, and Hashem is saying, if I will allow, uh, you know, what I will allow in the world are lower forms, distillations, manifestations, my thought, but the thought itself, there are no tools in this world that can receive the thought of itself. So now, Moshe Rabbeinu comes to Hashem with a question. How could it be that a tzaddik like Rabbi Akiva, who is suffering, now he's not just asking that. There's much more to Moshe Rabbeinu's questions. He's saying if it wasn't for Rabbi Akiva, as we know from Chazal, if it wasn't for Rabbi Akiva, the entire Torah would have been lost. All of Judaism would have been lost. And Moshe is saying all, all the effort I made to teach the Jews the Torah and the generations of the Torah spread and Yiddishkeit that came from that would not exist today without him, which was true. And really he's even better than me to give the Torah. Yeah. And without Rabbi Akiva, Moshe Rabbeinu's life would be meaningless. And Moshe says, okay, I want to see his reward. And Hashem shows that his skin is being sold in the marketplace. So how do you explain this? So Hashem says, you know, we're not going to get into the Arizal, and we're not going to get into the Maral, and we're not going to get into other stories. I'm just going to tell all up and Meaning that in order for you to understand what happened to Rabbi Kiva, you have to be able to understand my original thinking. And no human being is capable of understanding my original thinking. The source of Rabbi Akiva's torture is coming from a place that's called the infinite mind of Hashem. And that has never been enclosed. Hashem never can share it with people because people don't have the kalim, don't have the tools in a physical world that can contain such enormous light of God's thoughts in such a, in such a, in, in any kind of way. That's the idea of kach olo b'machshava. There are no letters, there's no spoken language, there's no one capable of absorbing the thoughts in their original form, and that's where it's coming from. And therefore, anyone who claims that it can be understood totally, whoever attempts to find the utensil to explain it using the letters of the Aleph base or our human minds in any kind of spoken language is totally mistaken. Versus this is it, it is only known by Hashem. Kach Olaba Mashava. And that's what the Arizal writes. He says he writes about this level of reality in the fourth source. He calls it in Aramaic, Reisha Delo Yisyado, the unknowable head. The head that no one can know. Batika Kedisha, the holy ancient one. That's what it is. The, in other words, the beginning of Hashem's mind, that's called his head, is an analogy, which is unknowable, 
The head of the ancient one nobody can know. And more familiar term to us would be what we mystically call the Kesser. The Kesser, the crown. The crown's above that. It's beyond, before the thinking stage. The will of Hashem. Right? It's interesting how Rabbi Akiva was putting the crowns, that would interpret those crowns. Anyway, so, so, so this is the level of Kach Olaba Machshava. This, this unknowable thought, Hashem allowed in the world a distilled version, right? Coming in on the lowest level, a kid reads the Chumash, it comes on a low level, meaning we put on Tfilin, putting on my Tfilin distills part of God's will to a higher level of even learning Zohar, but even that is still not even close to what is there to be known. To give you a couple, uh, uh, one true story and one analogy, we'll use a mushal to try to explain this to you. Okay, the true story was a great Kabbalist called Reb Shimshin Astropolia. Okay, he uh, was working on a commentary of the Shas, on the entire Talmud. And his commentary was done al pi Kabbal, Kabbalistically. Because you have to know, when you're learning the Talmud, you're learning an ox, goring an ox, and this and that, and all these, you know, that's the simple level. And then there's the Kabbalistic understanding that's getting into the deepest, deepest secrets of the mist in the universe. That's why anybody who learns Gemara says they don't understand it. It's very simple, because you're only learning it on, on the revealed level. The revealed level, you can't make sense of it. When you go on the deeper level, but you can't learn the deeper level until you know the simple level. But when you look at it in Kabbalistically, it's a whole different book. It's a whole different book. And that's why so many things that you frustrate people when they're first learning Talmud is because they're learning in the revealed way and that's really not the real, the ultimate way to learn it. Really, you have to learn it Kabbalistically. But it's not for people till they know it the real way and that would take a lifetime already. Anyway, he read it totally al pi Kabbalah. It took him 30 years to write it. 30 years to write a Kabbalistic commentary on the entire Talmud. And we're not talking about just the Agatha stories. We're talking about the simple not the, the complicated nitpicking page after page over one simple minutia of law all on a Kabbalistic level. So that became, it was like a 30 to 40 volume work. Try to imagine in your mind what work this was. Now, since it was a Kabbalist, and you know you just don't reveal these things, Stamazoi, so he knew he'd have to get permission from Hashem to do it. So uh, the mystics are very well oriented with the idea called a shelat chalom, where you ask a question in your dream, and there's different ways of doing it. You put the question under your pillow or whatever, and then you go to sleep, and when you go to sleep, and you have the right ideas, and we can't do any of this stuff, and then Hashem will give you the answer. Okay, anyway, so in the dream, Hashem comes in the dream, and he wants to know, he wants to say, Hashem, can I write, can I publish this? Hashem says, I want you to know everything you wrote is 100% true but you're not allowed to reveal all of this. You've got to be much more careful. You're, you're spilling too many beans for the populace. It's not going to be good. So what I want you to do is you have to edit it. Now, edit it doesn't mean just cutting out. It means you have to hide more in each word. You understand? You know, you could use, let's say, 15 words to describe how horrific something is and we'll gross people out. You can just write the word horrific. You know, it was a horrific scene. Now that would be edited from, and there was blood spilling all over, and there was arms flying here, and legs flying there, and guts were rolling out in the step. You know, or you could say it was a horrific scene. Did you lie? Did you cut anything out? You just distilled it. You hid a lot in every word. So he says, okay, I'll do that. So he spends the next 12 years, okay, and he edits it down to three volumes. So before he is going to do it again, he makes another Shalas Chalom. He makes another dream question. He asks Hashem, so is it okay? So Hashem comes in a dream. Hashem says, this is really good. You did a great job. But still, there's too much. Three vows is way too much. You're going to have to distill it a little bit more. Okay, how many years we got so far? 30 years, 12 years, all right? Now he spends the next seven years to get it down to one volume one volume, the entire commentary, I guess a small print, whatever. He didn't have all the Gemara there, you know, a lot of people write for him now, they give you the Chumash, the Rashi, this, and then your little commentary, but you can make it five volumes, because you've already got four volumes of something else. But that's just his thing, right? So then he comes in a dream, and Hashem says, you know what, Rip Shimshin, it's perfect! It's a hundred percent, you've done a tremendous job, it's amazing, but you don't need to publish it! So he says, why not? 
Because what you wrote, go look, is exactly Rashi's commentary to the Talmud. Now, what does that story tell you? It, it, it tells you, first of all, whenever you look at a Rashi, you know you're not seeing the whole story. And that's not just in Gemara. If anybody thinks that Rashi wasn't a Kabbalist, then they don't know Rashi. I mean, ah, Rashi was just a, a smart guy who gives you the understanding of the text in a simple way. Don't let it fool you. Rashi was just, you know, not, he was, um, he was um, uh, um, being like Hashem insofar as that he was hiding a lot too. Rashi could give you all the Kabbalistic understandings of the Gomorrah and the Chumash and everything, but Hashem said, you know, it's not a smart thing. Hide a lot. Don't let it all come out. You've got to distill it. So, but you see that it's capable of profound ideas can be written away. Oh, that's a very nice, simple interpretation. Now I understand the Gemara. That is a story. Now we'll give you a parable to understand this idea. And we'll so I'll understand the second Gemara, the Yom Kippur Mosque. The Yom Kippur Mosque is a little bit of a different answer. After all the horrific things are going on, Hashem says, if I hear another sound, I'll transform the world back to water, back to Tov of all. Means I'm going to bring it back to the way it originally was. So accept it. So I don't remember who said this analogy, but it's a beautiful analogy. There once was a uh, a tailor for the king who would sew many of the clothes for the realm, and the king said that he wants the most magnificent garment for the coronation, whatever, and he's going to have to use very, very expensive material, you know, like a like a million dollars a foot, whatever, like the most expensive. So he, he bring, uh, oh, this, uh, he, he came, the king came back from an exotic country and he brought this very expensive material and he says, you know, is there enough material for you to make a beautiful royal garment for me? So the, the t- tailor said, yes, I can do it for you. So the tailor spends the next few weeks and he makes the most magnificent garment for the king. Most magnificent. The king puts it on, he's very impressed. Now, of course, there's always jealous people in the world who are very jealous that this tailor was getting all the accolades of the king. So they want to cast aspersions on the tailor. So what could they possibly say? They're going to say, do you know this tailor, he cheated you. Because based on the amount of material you gave him, there should be at least another yard left over and he probably walked off with the yard and is walking away with thousands of dollars and he's not letting you have it. So the king said, nah, it can't be. He says, no, 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 ask it. So the king asks the tailor and says, perhaps maybe you didn't need all the material and, uh, you know, I'd like to know, did you really use all this? He says, absolutely every drop right to that. Here, you see these little few scraps here over here? That's all that's left. Everything I used, Mama, she, it barely, and I had to be very clever how I did it. I had to normally I had to use a different stitch and a that stitch. Really, you didn't give me enough material, but I was able to somehow make it work. King says, "No, I, I don't, I don't believe you." He said, well, "I'm telling you, it's the truth. I don't believe you, but it's the truth." And if and the king says, "If you can't prove it to me, I will kill you." So your Majesty, you don't want me to prove it for you. He says, "No, I want you. You don't want me to prove it. To you. If you don't prove it to me, I will kill you." He says, "Okay, leave me no choice." So what does he do? He rips the entire garment up, piece by piece by piece. And they lay it out, piece by piece. But to rip it already means you have to damage it beyond repair. And he rips it all up, all up, lays it out piece by piece, all cut up and all messed up. And you see exactly the way it was. Okay, now saw it back, now it's too late. Because I've damaged it to the point that I can't bring it back. So what does that have to do with anything? So the, pe- the, the point is that people ask God questions. God, give us an explanation. Hashem says, this is from my infinite mind. For my infinite mind, you can't understand it. For me, for you to understand it, I'd have to bring you back to the world of Tohu Vavo. I'd have to bring the world back to before it was created, when there was an astonishing void. An astonishing void that no human being could comprehend. And if I bring you back to that point in life, it means you won't exist. At that point, I can explain it to you when I take it all apart. But if I take it all apart, then there'll be no point in your life anymore. Because what, if you will understand life the way I do, then you'll have no free will choice at all. And there's no point in you living, no point in your existence. If you would know what I know, then you have no point in living. And that's the idea of tov avoh. 
astonishing void. It's so astonishing what Hashem's thinking is. Then you know the king looked at it. And said, wow, that's amazing. Okay, now I believe the rest of my life. This is, this is too late now. That was the last piece of material. Or what is what is your belief in me worth after I've proved it to you? The relationship's been destroyed. And that's that's the same thing. So both messes is the same. Kach Oliver Bakshava, this what was in my mind, my infinite mind that no one can understand. And the angels who are more clever than human beings. Hashem says, if you are not, I gotta bring the world way back to Tovalo. It's gotta be all the way back. And once it's all the way back, it's no world anymore. Because within the place where I'm thinking, it's, it's pre-people, pre-tar, pre-everything. And people can't function. Humans cannot function in that kind of life. And that's why he concludes, except that you who delight in the 2,000-year-old law. Because you who delight in the 2,000-year-old law, because what you are delighting in is the distilled version of my thoughts. And that you can delight in. Getting some idea of what I'm dealing with, and be happy, but you can't know everything I'm knowing. It is just not possible. This, this is not, you know, a cop out. This is, this is the truth. Or as I like to give the, the, the analogy uh, of, of Einstein and the little baby, right? Einstein who knows formulas and this and that and everything else. What is Einstein going to talk about to his two-year-old grandchild? What's he going to talk about? Now he's going to talk about, you know, coochie coochie coo, you know, and, and that's about it. And, and, and that's much as a little child's going to understand. Maybe Barney, you know, but he's not going to even be able, he can't even do one plus one. Right? So now, what, and, and you look at, and you look at Einstein, you see him so coochie coochie coo, he says, well, Barney's funny, blah, 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 blah. And, he's, and, 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 and say, uh, listen, this is the great Einstein, the great mind, but that's what he has to filter to the child. Now, no one's going to say that Einstein isn't any smarter than the kid, right? Now, here's the question that I always like to ask. Tell me, where is there a larger gap between the distance between the two-year-old and Einstein's mind? Gap. How big is the gap? It's a pretty big gap. Or the gap between Einstein's mind and the infinite mind of God's? Nobody would ever, chas v'shalom, say that Einstein isn't smart because the two-year-old doesn't understand him. You see, the two-year-old does not have the mind to understand Einstein, right? Why are we so foolish to think that just because you are as smart as Einstein means you're any closer to the infinite understanding of reality than the two-year-old is even closer to Einstein, right? And this, this is not, you know, a cop-out. This is logic. A finite mind is limited by finite understandings. An infinite mind, unless you don't want to accept it as an infinite being. Right? So, so, so that's what, what Hashem is saying over here. When, when you and I, when you and I look at a Rashi, you should know it's much deeper than the Rashi is. And can you imagine how long it took Rashi to enclose all the deep interpretations, the years to do this? This is the level that the Rizal is saying is Rashi, the Lishyada, the head that's unknowing. Even after Hashem gives us the Torah, He didn't give us any of the original thoughts because no person can at all comprehend them. This is what the rabbis also write in the Midrash to Hillim. They said, Liba lupume logalia. His heart to his mouth was never revealed. Hashem would, what was in Hashem's heart, he could never reveal via his mouth and tell it to others. And so if he couldn't reveal it to others, nobody else could reveal it. In other words, Hashem is saying, there's things in my heart, quote unquote, he doesn't have a heart, but things in my heart that I haven't mentioned in my mouth. I haven't told you everything that's in my heart because it's not possible. So with this understanding, let's go back to the Egyptian exile. So even though the rabbis tell us the reason for the Egyptian exile, and even you got the Ariza, and you got the Maral, and say, well, the opera made a mistake, and since there was a blemish in the root and the foundation, then others had to suffer. Or if a first man made a mistake, all that, these are great explanations, but they're still limited in the world of Pardes, which Hashem allowed to descend into this world. But nevertheless, even if you're learning Arizal already, you're learning the deepest Gilgulim and this and that, and it's all 100% true, but it's all for sure not the whole story. Even the Arizal, when you talk about Gilgulim, is only a tool. It's only a lavush, it's a garment. But the shor is the root of the, of the Golas. It comes from where? It comes from Kach Olava Machshava. That came to my mind. That's in God's mind. Hashem never and can't 
explain it to anyone. Just like there's many reasons suggested for a poradum, a red heifer, but to say this is the reason, that's not possible. So every explanation that we can give for the Egyptian exile, we'll call them branches. Branches. But the root of why it has to happen at all that way, that's unknowable. At the end of the day, okay, he did this, but why does a baby have to be killed for that? How does killing a baby bring a kapora? You know, why do you have to flay Rebbe Akiva's flesh? Why can't he just peacefully go to sleep and die? You know, these are ideas that no branch is ever going to explain because we just don't have the brains to understand it. We, we're limited. Our ideas of pain, suffering, right, wrong, they're so limited by the limitations of our brains. Right? <clears throat> and therefore, the Torah never wrote a reason for the Egyptian exile because all the explanations of the rabbis, they don't reach the goal. They don't reach the unknowing head of Hashem because the root of the Egyptian exile was before Avram Avinu and before Adam Arishon, before any of these things, Hashem already had it plugged into the world. The morale only goes back as far as Avram. Their reason will go, go, go better, go back as far as Adam Arishon. But that's where they stop because before there even was a world, Hashem had a reason that we just can't understand that reason. That's why it's also interesting why Chazal said in the very first passage of the Torah, when Hashem created the world, it says there was Tov, Vavov, Vachoshech, Apneha, Tohom. There's an empty void and all that. So the Medrash says, Toho, that's the kingdom of Bavel. Vo is the kingdom of Madai. Choshech is the kingdom of Yavan. And Tohom is the kingdom of Rome. So we see even in the beginning of the Torah, they start speaking about the four exiles. So the, the Sephardim asks, well, why is there a hint to the Gullus of, e of Egypt? Which is the, the Gullus of all Gulluses. Why is it a hint to the beginning of the Torah? Again, the same answer. Because all of the other Gullios, they can be somehow found within the logic of the Torah that Hashem has presented. But the Golos Mitzrayim, that's beyond. It's totally beyond. It's from a root that we have no understanding of, 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 at all. The rabbis can explain the four exams, but that's only part of the Torah that can be grasped by human beings. But there's a part that cannot be grasped at all. And that part is the part that goes back to the Yitzhak Mitzrayim, and that comes all the way back to the beginning. The root of all suffering goes back to the Egyptian exile. All Tsaras, that all Jews were really ever to go through in life, after all the explanations, none of them can properly explain the root fundamental reason for all this. And, and we have to intellectually be comfortable with that understanding and that explanation. This is not meant to be a cop-out explanation. It's meant to be a very logical explanation that it's just not capable. Hashem cannot reveal his infinite understanding. If he, would, if he would reveal it to us, we would no longer be finite beings. We would no longer exist the way we are. And so Kabbalah Homer now, if, if we look, you know, now what makes it even harder for us, here's the challenging part, is when, when we have to look at the Holocaust of what had happened, really the Holocaust makes Rabbi Akiva's death look quite mild. And therefore, when people try to give an answer to the question about the Holocaust, and even people, great rabbis, give answers, what do you think if you would ask Hashem the question? Let's say we had a medrash you know, on, the, on the Holocaust. You had Tanoim, rabbis of the Talmud, who were expounding on this Holocaust. And the angels, what's even better, the angels in 1942 are crying to Hashem, He's watching a hall. He's watching the Piazetzna Rebbe being shot and killed by the hands of the Nazis. Don't you think the angel would say, Hashem, zu Torah, zu schara? What do you think Hashem would answer? Shtok, kach olabamachshem. Be quiet, because this is what ascended to my thoughts. That's the answer. Do you want me to bring the world back to Tov Vavohu? To get an explanation for this? That's, that's what the Holocaust is. So yes, doesn't mean to say we don't try to find any answers because there's still a part of that history we have to we have to understand what can we learn from this but to say I want the answer the answer is just as not knowing as the answer for why the Jews were in Egypt now let me read for you a little section from the Piazetz Nerebi himself who, who wrote the work Eish Kodesh Piazetz Nerebi uh, was an extremely extremely brilliant man whose life was cut short because of the Holocaust. He, he lived in a city, Piazetsno, which was a suburb of Warsaw. And then he eventually went to Warsaw, was a Rebbe in Warsaw. 
<coughs> and he, he wrote the famous uh, book, Chova Shatalmidim, which was written before the Holocaust. It was a very beautiful psychological educational book that's been translated into English called The Student's Obligation that is out of print, unfortunately, now. But during the Holocaust, while in the Warsaw Ghetto, he wrote a sefer called Eish Kodesh, The Holy Fire, uh, was a thin volume which is translated into English, The Sacred Fire, and everything in English is much bigger than in Hebrew. But let, and, and he was, uh, wrote different things from when they were in the ghetto, 1941 through 1942, 1940, from October 1940 to his last essay, July 1942. And he did the ghetto, there were no svarim, nothing. He wrote just from his knowledge. Uh, he, right in the beginning, 1939, he, he, lost his, he lost his wife, he lost his kid, lost, I think, his mother-in-law, I don't remember. He lost m m most of the family. He lost very early. And he encouraged the Hasidim and all the Yidin in the ghetto to keep going. We have to keep doing our vote of Hashem. He brought encouragement to them. And while he did that, he wrote this. And it was a miracle how this, the, the uh, what do you call it, the notes were found. He left them, he left in the Holocaust, the, the ghetto burnt. So he, he put it like in a container, a garbage container, or whatever. He left the manuscripts there, and he davened to Hashem, and he wrote in there, I hope someone will find this one day. And miraculously, after the Holocaust, they were found. Obviously, Hashem wanted us to have this. They're, we don't know the, the thousands of manuscripts that he can left that were never found. But obviously, his was meant to be found. He gives a long, beautiful essay that I think I'll, maybe I'll do Shabbos uh, in the alternative class. But I just want to come to the end. He talks about faith. Uh, I'm reading a little bit before where I gave you the citation. Just a little bit before it. But you'll see yours in a minute. Basically, what do you think all the Hasidim asked? Uh, Rebbe, how can this be? Okay, we're not talking about now, you know, we're not talking about the secular Jews who said that Berlin is Yerushalayim, that the Orsameach said, for those Jews, Hashem's going to punish you. you. You give up Hashem, you're going to get punished. That already our minds can understand a little bit. God writes in the Torah, you leave me, I'm going to bring terrible things to you. Okay, I mean, I can hear it. But the always question, so what about all the from Hasidish Jews? Right. Okay, I don't want to get into you know answers and all that, but but what but, but this who he was dealing with, he was with the Hasidim, and I'm sure non Hasidim too. But he says, in all honesty, what room is there, God forbid, for doubts or questions? Admittedly, Jews endure suffering of the sort with which we are currently afflicted only every few hundred years. So we only get pogroms like this every few hundred years, and it's not that bad. <clears throat> Still, how can we expect our hope? to understand these God's actions and then allow our faith to be damaged, God forbid, upon finding that we cannot understand them. Here, let me read that. I, I should have really put that in. I didn't. Again, how can we expect our hope to under, or hope to understand these God's actions and then allow our faith to be damaged, God forbid, upon finding that we cannot understand them? If one blade of grass created by God is beyond our understanding, how much more unfathomable is the soul? And if we do not understand a soul, how much less do we understand an angel? How much less even do we understand the mind of God? Stop. No, I'm just... Okay. How could we possibly expect to grasp with our mind which God knows and understands? This is what the Rebbe's talking to. This is what he's talking about. This. Now I get the part that uh, you have written down. What excuse does a person have to question God and have his faith damaged by this prevailing suffering more than all the Jews who went through suffering in bygone times? Remember, it's not Yassi Mahalowitz saying these words into the year 2010. It's a P.S.S. and Rebbe who's seen his family get blown up. He's seen thousands of Jews killed. He's his whole life is destroyed. And he only knows a matter of time until he gets killed. Living under the worst conditions. He's writing it. You have to always remember who's writing it. You can yell at me and scream at me. You're going to yell at him? Why should a person's faith become damaged now if it was not damaged when he read descriptions of Jewish suffering from antiquity to the present day in scripture, the Talmud of the Medrash? How about when you hear millions of Jews, blood flowed in Betar? Those who say that suffering such as this has never befallen the Jewish people are mistaken. There was torture comparable to ours in the destruction of the temple and at Betar. And then he says Hashem should help us. But then, this was written um, September 22nd, 1941. No, I'm sorry. No. This was written December 6th, 1941. That's three months into the Holocaust. Note added by the author, and I have it there. On the eve of the Holy Shabbos, Kislev 18, November 27th, 1942, a year later. 
He says, only such torment as was endured until the middle of 1942 has ever transpired previously in history. Until the middle of 1942, it wasn't anything new. The bizarre tortures and the freakish, brutal murders that have been invented for us by the depraved, perverted murderers solely for the suffering of Israel since the middle of 1942 are, according to my knowledge of the words of our sages of blessed memory and of the chronicles of Jewish people in general, unprecedented and unparalleled. Then they, he adds, May Hashem have mercy upon us and save us from the hands of the blink of an eye. What's the P.S.S. the Rebbe adding to this last? Is he, is he now saying with the last prayer and I strike out everything I wrote in the whole essay a year ago? He's not saying that. He's saying, he's saying there is no point for a Jew to question God because we can't go to that point of understanding that he doesn't have. And anyone trying to explain it is trying to explain something that only Hashem knows. But the P.S.S. and Rebbe, he's saying, but even now that we're at the point of Rebbe Akiva, we're at the point of Rebbe Akiva, where it's, it's, it's worse than it's ever, ever been. And he says, we still can't let that shake our faith. Now you can at least understand why people did lose it, because even the Rebbe admits it's worse than we ever had. But even if it's worse than we ever had, it doesn't change the criteria of the question and the foolishness of trying to understand the answer. So, so, so that, that's what the Rebbe was telling us over here. He says, even if it's like Rebbe Akiva, still we have to have Bitochon Hashem, even though it's worse than anything else. In other words, in, in 1940, when I say, what is it any worse than we ever had before? What, what are we expecting you to do more than what Jews have always had to do? You always have to believe in Hashem. You can't understand things you can't understand. But then a year later, it says, but I want you to know, this is talk of worse than it's ever been. So now you may even have a, now you really have at least a stronger question. But the answer is still the same answer. So, so anybody who wants to try to explain the Holocaust is trying to explain what came from the unknowing mind of Hashem, just like in Egypt. So now it has to bring us to one more question, though. So the question is, so why does Hashem do this to us? So what's the purpose? Why didn't Hashem give this blessed mission to some other people? So I understand, I understand. You know, we're the Jewish people and there's reasons we don't understand and you know, and it turned out pretty good when we left Egypt, it was not bad and this and that. But you know, like why, why me? I, I understand there's reasons I understand but I'm Michael on it, you know. So the truth of the matter is, there's no answer to that question either. What do I mean? Well, you know the famous Rashi in the beginning of Bereshis. It says Bereshis, and Rashi says it can't mean just Bereshis in the beginning. It, it says the whole world was created, Bereshis, Bishvil Reshis. Because of the Jewish people, Hashem created the world. So what does that mean? So it really means that the existence of the Jewish people, oh, let me back it up, just like the, the, the root of suffering comes from God's original thought that can't be explained, so too does the existence of the Jewish people come from the root of that is from the intelligence of God that no one can understand either. It's just as not understandable. And when a Jew once came to Rabbi Nosson of Breslov, he had all kinds of troubles finding a shidduch. And he cried to Rabbi Nosson. He says, oh, it's terrible, my life is terrible, this is that. Rabbi Nosson said, listen, Yaakov Avinu also had problems with shidduchim. He didn't find a shidduch until he was 77. You know, and even then they switched out and he had problems with Shadduchim, so you're not the only one. So the guy said, how could you compare me to Yaakov? Every moment of Yaakov was filled with the deepest mysteries. We can't understand what's going on. Yaakov was a halak of men. She was a founding father. You can't compare him. His life was a mystery. So Rabbi Nassim turned around and said to him, listen, your life is also filled with mysteries. It's no different. So the point is, just like holocausts and all these things come from the Reisha, the Lomisyada, the unknowing mind of Hashem, so too does the Jewish people. The Jewish people also, all of the Machshav the existence of Jewish people also came to God's mind before he created the world. Which now explains the love that Hashem has for the Jewish people that also cannot be articulated in the letters of the Aleph Beis. Just like there's nothing written to explain why there has to be such Holocaust type of suffering because it's beyond human understanding. The love that Hashem has for us is beyond human understanding too. And since it's so unknowable, 
He, there's no words that can describe, you know, even, even in contemporary songs they say that. There's no words that can express how I feel. No, and you don't think, if you're talking, now that, and you're a finite being with only finite thoughts, you can't express it. How about the infinite being telling it to finite people? So really, Hashem loves us from such a deep place, there's no words in the Torah that can explain the love that He has for us. Now, there is a downside to that, because since He can't express the way it really is, we can tend to be discouraged and lose hope and faith. But what Hashem does say in Sefer Dvarim, He's a very interesting word, He says, Nor because you are more numerous than all the peoples did Hashem chashak bochem. Did Hashem chashak have a cheshek for you. Now in English we use the word desire. It wasn't because you were a big people that Hashem desire you, but rather because of Hashem's love for you. Now it's interesting, what does the word cheshek mean? Cheshek, when you try to translate this, I have a cheshek, you know, yeah, I got a cheshek for a salami sandwich now. Now explain that. Where does it come from? A feeling. Explain it. Articulate it in a way that I can understand why. You can't. Cheshek means I can't explain it. Cheshek means you love something in a way that doesn't have an explanation. You know, lahavdo, lahavdo, I'm using a bad analogy. Why do you like chocolate more than vanilla? I want a scientific proof of it. I can't explain it. That's the way it is, man. That's the way it is. So, you know, let, let's say even, uh, why do you love this person? You know, and I'm going to prove to you you should love this other one better. Let's say, that, you know, a um, husband loves his wife. And I said, why do you love your wife? I'm going to show another woman. She, I'm going to prove to you 50 times more. She's 10 times better than your wife. And you should love this one. Okay, and then he's going to say, what do you want? I have a cheshek. That's it. I can't, I can't explain it. It's a reality. That's what's there. So when Hashem describes, it's not, it's not this a logical love. It means to say it's, it's a logic that's beyond our logic. It's, it's a level of cheshek. Where don't even begin to have me explain to you why I love you. The love I have to have a certain people who I will have this connection with is not possible to be explained. So it, it goes hand in hand. Just like God can't give us the reason for the Holocaust. But he also can't give you the, the total reason for why he loves you so much. And there are no words that can explain how much, even though he says, says every yant of you elevated us beyond all the goyim and you love us and you this. But those words are so far away from the ultimate feeling because you can't explain this love that Hashem has for us, this importance that he has for us. So, so we ask Hashem, why do we have to go through this mysterious business? Why do our lives have to be conducted in a way that we can't understand what you're doing? Why is it that there's no historian, no philosopher, no psychologist can explain the suffering of Jewish people? And for that matter, none of them can explain why the Jewish people still survive. Which is a famous uh, class that many of you have heard. Right? How, how is it that with so much anti semitism we still survive? The answer is because if God wants it, there's no explanations for it. It's beyond explanation. The answer is very simple. The answer to all the questions is, Hashem says, I have a cheshek for you. I have such a love for you, and it's so unfortunate you don't have the tools to understand. <coughs> you don't have the tools to understand it. So, shtok, be quiet, kachalab and machshava. This is what came onto my mind. That's what came into my mind. There's, there's no real expl explanations for Mitzrayim. There's no real explanations for the Holocaust that your mind can ever be satisfied. But, but you have to be, have, at least, you have to have one thing, trust. That Hashem was a kind God who loves you, has demonstrated so much love for us. Even though it's limited as how much we can totally understand, we have to say, you know what, I trust Him. And that's really what Amuna boils down to. So consequently, the re what's going to be the result? The result is going to be a redemption that the Jewish people could never, ever imagine either. Now, can you imagine if Moshe is going to sit down, the first day he comes to Egypt, he's going to, I'm going to tell you exactly what's going to happen. If he would say to the Jews, they would say, you're a lunatic. You are crazy. Right? It, it, there's, there's no way. There's no way they would believe it. They wouldn't believe it because we're totally not deserving. We can never imagine such a thing. Can you imagine he's going to say the water's going to turn into blood? Can you imagine if he would have predict, tell them what the ten plagues would have been and the Kriyas Yamsuf and the power wouldn't give in. If anybody would say this was going to happen, what would they say about it? You're crazy. So the Geula, the redemption, also comes from a place that we don't understand. 
And even though we read, there's laps written in the Navi, and laps written in the Rishonim, and laps written in the Chazal, about what's going to be like when Mashiach comes. But we say, well, how is it going to be different exactly? Who will I be married to? What does it mean I won't have to work? What does it mean my parents are going to go back? You know, you know, it's all from our silly, <laughs> finite understandings of what paradise means. The Geula is called, it's coming from the Or HaGonus, it's coming from a hidden light. And we don't know at all what this Mashiach means. Well, the Rambam writes, well, I mean, they write, we don't know what that means. We don't, we don't have the brains that understand what does it mean that you know, we're all going to want to be close to Hashem. We just don't know what that means. We don't know what it means. This is, this is from before creation. This is the light that Hashem on the second day he hid. That people can't appreciate that light. You, know, you can't even begin to understand why are we worthy for Hashem to redeem us. We can't comprehend how much, how could Hashem love such a despicable people. We don't listen to what he says. We do things badafka against him. We bring cell phones into Chazor shots, And when we're talking about Hashem, we're talking on the cell phone. Why would Hashem even care about us? Good questions. And that's what many people give up. Right? That's what Jewish people ask Moshe. They said, how can you redeem us? We're on the 49th level of impurity. You know what that means? We're the lowest of the law. There's no way you're going to take us back. And what did Moshe Rabbeinu answer them? Hashem said, tell him, tell him, since I want you to be redeemed, that's why you're going to be redeemed. It might not be yet the right time for it, but it's going to happen. So what do we end off? So only Hashem, who knows the secret of his life, of his love for every Jew, Hashem knows that and we don't understand that. And he only Hashem knows the real reason for the suffering of every single Jew. So only Hashem will be able to reveal the secret of the Geula for every single Jew. Because Hashem says, I have a cheshek for you. So that, that love that's unknowing, that's the source of it all. And this is what this next six weeks is all about. It's, it's where we really have to work on our amuna. At the end of the day, you can't have a relationship with Hashem with everything being explained. There has to be a point of intellectual uh, um, uh, uh, humility to be able to at least admit one of the most logical premises in the world it's not possible for a finite being to understand everything that infinite being has to offer and if we can get by as we said last week what do we say there's a Mashiach and the Nachash was the Nun and the Mem Yud remember we said last week Nun means I have all 50 levels I know everything the only person who can criticize God is a person who thinks he's Mr. Know-it-all if you think you know everything then you have all kinds of questions on God if you at least are smart enough to know you don't know something and God could know something more than you, then the, the possibilities are endless. And everybody knows, everybody knows, a good parent, how much you suffer from your kids. Every time when you are doing what's in the best interest of the child, and the child has no kalim to understand why you give him a curfew, why you say you can't drive a car even though you're 16, because they have no idea what it means after three accidents no one's going to drive again in the whole house. You can say it to them and they just don't get it. Like say, you know, we, I love you, I can't give you the car. Because if you smash it up three times, Abba cannot drive to work. Like, you know, that, that's like important. They don't get it because their minds don't get it. They just don't get it that you have to work to make money to be able to enjoy the home that they're in. They don't get it. They know one thing. I hate you. Because you know I want more than anything else to have the car Saturday night in a blizzard with ice and I, I'm, a, I, I'm a good driver because I've driven three times uh, does this sound familiar? and if you really love me and where do they want to go? I want to go to a party so the fire says I'll drive you to the party no, I have to have the car because I have to show off to everybody that I have a car and what invariably happens the parent who gives in the, in, the insurance rate sooner or later going up $2,000 you know and then of course you have to pay because you're the one with the money, right? But, uh, you know, and you hear kids say, I hate you. Now, when you look at that, don't you see how silly they are? And you're talking about this, right? Teenagers, right? We're not talking about a three-year-old. We're not talking about a little, little Moishi who's three years old and you don't give him like, the 17th candy at 12 o'clock at night because he'll vomit. Go explain to a three-year-old who never vomited you're going to vomit if you eat too much chocolate. They don't, they don't want to. You're a terrible parent. You didn't give him chocolate. Right? You're a terrible parent. You don't give him the car. You know what the problem is? With most adults, they never have grown up. Still the same selfish, narcissistic people. I, I should get everything I want. And I should do whatever I want. Everything. And, and God says, life isn't that simple. If you had my mind, you'd understand what I was doing. 
So that's that's so Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu can't give you the answers. But at the end of the day, Moshe Rabbeinu still put on Talis and Tefillin every day. And all of Rabbi Akiva's students still put on Talis and Tefillin every day after watching the Rebbe getting burnt. And at the end of the day, people who learned the Torah from the P.S.S. and Rebbe, they still put on Talis and Tefillin every day. Right? So that they know there's something that they don't know. And we should be happy with that understanding. Again, this is not blind faith. This is not blind faith. This only makes sense, only logical. You had a question? Yeah. It's kind of an uncomfortable question, but if we know at the end of the day that we really can't know anything because, you know, we're, we're, we're finite and we just can't get the answers, why, why should we even look? Why should we even look? Because the answer is, to the degree that one is capable of understanding, one should understand. Because, first of all, it, it gives you a better feeling for what you're doing. Why should I put on film? Because God said so. That's nice. But you know what? And, and really that should be the final answer. But if you understand what putting on your film accomplishes, you can appreciate so much more what you're doing. There is a little problem we have. We're human beings. And as human beings, it helps to have a little bit of feeling for what you're doing. That's the way God created us. And the Chovos Avavos really at, it talks about your question at great length in his introduction to the Sefer. He says, the whole point of the Chovos Avavos was to really understand what God is as much as humanly possible. And what are you trying to say? You can never understand what God is. Why are you trying to understand it all? So we have an obligation to understand to the limits that our minds can understand. To what you can understand, you should understand because that will bring you closer to Hashem. You know, when you learn things that are really geschmack, I mean, wow, now this makes a lot more sense. Now I really understand why I'm putting on the phone. So when the Yetzirah Horror comes, say, why should you put on the phone? make a difference? He says, what do you mean it does? It, it does something in the highest realms. It does this, it does that, it does that, it that. So you, it motivates you. And we all need a little bit of motivation. Mora says, the olam yehe, a person should always be doing things shalolishma, mitok shalolishma, balishma. You always need a little bit of shalolishma. You know, there's a big Yetzirah that wants to beat you up every day. So, you know, the more knowledge you have, the easier it is to deal with the Yetzirah. So, clearly, you know, if, if, if very few people can just go through life completely and, and not understand why they're doing what they're doing on any level. That's why Hashem gave us the ability to understand what we can understand. To the degree you can understand, if you understand how important davening is, you won't talk during davening. <coughs> if you understand it, it becomes easier for you to deal with the HR. It tells you not to talk during davening. Very few people can, are the kind of people who are just like toves. Whatever Hashem says I'll do, I don't even think to do otherwise. There's very few people on that level. So Hashem, you know, why does Hashem put a taste in an apple? Why does He put a taste in an apple? Just eat an apple without any vitamins. Is it going to make a difference? Because Hashem wants you to enjoy it. He wants you to enjoy it. So if Hashem gives you the taste of Torah, because He wants you to enjoy the Torah. And the more you enjoy it, the better you'll understand it. So that's why we, we are commanded. We are commanded to try to understand what we can understand, we must understand. But what we can't understand, I say that's as far as Hashem wants us to go. So if I understand, you know, you know, if I understand what is so bad about Lush and Hara, and there's lots of Chazal, you know, it's going to motivate you not to talk Lush and Hara. But why even after talking about Shonara should I get punished? Well, that really thinks maybe we can't understand. But at least I appreciate what happens because I speak Lashonara. Because people say, well, I just said words. What did I do? Not understand words. It's much worse than that. Well, that you need explanations. Once you have the explanations, that will motivate you to not talk.